I think David is one of the most uh, interesting people as we study the Old Testament and so much is written about David and uh, we, we know so much about all of his life. We uh, know, of course, early on when uh, David was a very young man, a shepherd, and we're all perhaps most familiar with uh, his battle with Goliath. And uh, we, we know that he is the youngest of eight sons of Jesse. And a little background before uh, David went to battle Goliath, the Philistine giant, uh, the prophet had looked at all of uh, Jesse's sons and uh, in one way or another, they were kindly rejected to being uh, blessed with this uh, blessing. And the uh, prophet asked Jesse if he had any other sons. He says, well, yeah, I've got one young son. It's a shepherd back watching the flock. So they brought uh, David in, and he was blessed. But if we go back, uh, we see we often uh, kindly read over this and we know the end, but we don't understand a lot of stuff that was going on. Of course, David, we know, was blessed as uh, the children of Israel were battling the Philistines, and the Philistines had this super weapon, this 10-foot giant that had uh, all of the armor and the shield and the sword, and he challenged any of God's uh, warriors to come out and, and fight him. And he would kill all of them. So uh, we see David being chosen as the one to go and fight Goliath. And if we look back in 1 Samuel, we see uh, uh, the details of exactly what was happening there. We find Saul pulled David out. He gave him a, a big uh, sword and a shield. We look at 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, and begin there in verse 39. It said, David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he hadn't tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So he took them off. He was a young shepherd boy. He had never even held a shield or a sword and, and hadn't fought. So, uh, of course, the general are wanting to lead the army, put all of this armor on David. And David said, I can't use this. I can't even carry it. He threw it off. So he took them off. So verse 40, he says, he took his staff. It's his staff that he used in, in uh, tending his sheep in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the book and put brook and put them in the shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine so the Philistine came and he began to draw near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him and when the Philistine looked and about and saw David he disdained him, for he was only a youth, broody and good-looking. So we find this Philistine, he's expecting a big tall soldier to come out with a sword and shield and battle him to death. And here this young shepherd boy comes out, doesn't even have a sword or a shield, any uh, weapons that he could see. So the Philistine was mad. Why have you sent this little boy out here to, to uh, fight me? So verse 43, he said, he said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass 
of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth and all of the earth might know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. So we see this young shepherd, David, going up against this 10-foot giant, confident in his faith and in the Lord's blessing. And uh, we see even though he seems to be uh, overwhelmed by the, the strength and the size of this Philistine, we see his confidence and his faith in the Lord. And this, of course, is one of David's high points. So it goes on and says the Philistine rose and drew near to David and David hurried and ran forward to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. And he drew out the sword out of the Philistine and, and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So in having his faith and having the Lord with him, he overpowers this Philistine. And, and we see that as, as a lesson, you know, we, one of the first lessons we can learn from David as we look at him as a very young shepherd boy, uh, boy. We can put our faith in the Lord. We can accept him as our Savior. You know, we can live our Christian life and we know that it's not going to always be grand and we're not going to always be uh, on a high plane, but we're going to have problems and troubles and be lowly and uh, tempted many times but but we know if we put our faith and trust in the Lord the Lord will deliver us I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me so so we see through David's faith here that what he accomplished with of course the Lord's help so uh, we see here uh, this of course was one of David's uh, uh, most high points but we know uh, a lot about David uh, as he grew up uh, Saul uh, was very fond of David and uh, as David grew more popular and in strength we find Saul getting jealous of David and he later on in David's life wanted to kill him have him killed so David had to flee and hide from Saul and, uh, until Saul's death. And finally David, we found, becomes king. And David is a, a good king and rules uh, the kingdom uh, in a, a righteous way and does good. But then we know, of course, David has his weaknesses too. And uh, we, we see in, in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, we see his weakness as he views Bathsheba uh, and, and his weakness and his desire for her causes him to commit adultery with Bathsheba. So uh, we know that once sin has conceived that uh, it often grows and grows. So we find uh, Bathsheba with child, and David knows this. So we find uh, David, of course, bringing Uriah in, Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband, eventually sending him to battle, and having, he's uh, killed. And uh, David takes Bathsheba as his wife. But we find uh, that all is not well. We know God is certainly not pleased with what David has done and uh, committing adultery with uh, Bathsheba. On down in 
2 Samuel, we find uh, what happens afterwards in chapter 11, beginning in verse 26. We said, When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So we find out what happens as uh, Nathan comes and confronts David with this. In in chapter 12, verse 1, The Lord sent Nathan to David and came to him and said, There were two men in the city, one rich and one poor, and the rich man exceedingly had many flocks and herds, But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb which he had brought and nourished and it grew up together with him and his children. He ate of his own food and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare for this wayman who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who came to him. So David heard this, and David grew angry. And verse 5 said, David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. So now the judgment comes in 7. Nathan said to David, you are that man. You are that man that he has just gotten so angry about from taking this poor man's lamb. Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. On down verse 9 he says, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do this evil in his sight? You've killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus the Lord said, Behold, I will rise up adversity against you from your own house. So we see later on that's exactly what's happened. The son that was born to Bathsheba died. David grieved over that son. And uh, we we find later, of course, that uh, they had another son, Solomon, that later became king. So, uh, you know, we, we see... Another son, Absalom, was, had uh, risen up against David and, and tried to take over his kingdom. We find he was killed. David grieved uh, mightily for this son that was killed. Uh, but, but we find uh, David uh, realizing what he had done and, and repenting. And he had this uh, adversity in his house from that day forward unto his death. So we, we see that David, in a sense, is easy to uh, look to, and, and we know he's human. He is a great leader. He does great things, but we see his weakness. And we know, you know that none of us are perfect, but we uh, need to realize our weaknesses. We need to look to the Lord for our strength and for our help in the time of trouble. And and we know he will be there for us. David, in his lowest, uh, one of his lowest points in the 142nd uh, Psalm, you know, said nobody cared for him. But but we know that uh, later on he, he saw the Lord and the Lord's strength and the Lord's love. And we too can rise out of problems and and heartache and sorrow that we know we're going to face in this world because we know many care for us many care for us we we can look all throughout 
the Bible and especially the New Testament. And, and we know that, of course, God loves us. God loves us uh, more than we can ever imagine. We think uh, of, of God and we know from that uh, John, the third chapter, we know of his great love there as uh, a verse that's often quoted uh, many, many times, the third chapter of John. And uh, beginning in verse 14, <clears throat> this is Jesus uh, talking, says, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And that common verse, everyone can probably quote, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So we, we often... Uh, don't think of God's love for us, for each and every one of us, all down through history. You know, we, we can uh, see and we can kindly identify with during war of uh, soldiers that's gone to war. And uh, we know many, of course, give their lives in battle. And uh, we, can, we can picture uh, a soldier coming to a family and, and telling them about uh, a son or, you know, someone that's been killed in battle. And that's hard for a parent to accept. Uh, you know, they may realize that that's a possibility uh, when they went to war. But if you think just a minute, those parents didn't see that soldier die. They didn't know what he went through. Or maybe, you know, the pain that he went through. But think of God. He saw his only begotten son on the cross of Calvary. He saw him scourged, beaten, crown of thorns on his head. He saw him nailed to that cross. But out of, of his love... For us, you know, he let his son die on the cross of Calvary. Showed his love for each and every one of us. He cares for us. He, he wants everyone to be saved. But we have to obey his will. We've got to obey his plan of salvation. Jesus Christ, he came to earth knowing his charge, what he was charged to do. Jesus loved us. He loved us. He cared for us, for all of us. He knew what was coming. When he chose his disciples, he chose them and, and tried to prepare them for a time when he knew he was going to be gone. And they had this great commission to carry that gospel to all the known world at that time. He knew the pain, the agony on the cross of Calvary that, that he was to suffer. And later on, of course, many, not all of the disciples, you know, gave their lives to many in agonizing death because of their love for us, their love for wanting to get the word out. Many care for us. Many care for us, acknowledge us. Christ gave his life an agonizing death for us because he loved us. He wanted to see all of us saved. He said, I go back to heaven to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. He's gone to prepare that place for us. He loves us. He's waiting for us to obey him, accept him as Lord and Savior. So we know that God cares for us, that Christ cares for us. 
We, we know, of course, of, of Jesus' uh, betrayal by Judas and, and all he went through. But we know that uh, as a Christian, you know, we know that we have the gift of eternal life if we but reach out and, and accept him as our Lord and Savior. So we know uh, God loves us and, and Christ gave his only, uh, gave his life on the cross of Calvary. And we know that we too uh, have a comforter. We know that uh, Christ has gone back to heaven, but he promised the disciples, as he told them to go to Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost, they would be sent a comforter. And we find in the second chapter of Acts, that's what happened when Peter preached uh, that gospel sermon. Uh, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and it's important in our lives to help us, encourage us, give us strength today. We, we see a lot of info if we look to Romans, the eighth chapter. We see uh, there in, in the eighth chapter and part of the ninth chapter uh, as, Luke, as uh, Paul writes to the Romans concerning the Spirit and the importance of the Spirit. In Romans 8 and verse 12, he says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So, uh, we see there the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, we may be glorified together. So uh, we see there the Spirit cares for us, wants us to... Uh, come to the Lord, obey the Lord, and be a child of God. On down in uh, verse 26, he goes on, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So uh, we, we see here the importance of, of the Spirit in our lives too. So we can take great comfort in, in our faith today, knowing our faith that uh, those who care for us loved us enough and wanted us to be saved and not be lost. So uh, Christ, you know, before he ascended back to heaven, he said in, in the 28th chapter of Matthew that, that great commission, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this is a great commission that these apostles had and uh, established many churches. And uh, we, we see later on as, as Paul went on his journeys and established many of these churches uh, churches would stay with them till leaders were taught and brought up and the church was self-sufficient uh, and then go on and, and many uh, of course led lost souls to Christ and that was the great commission that was their mission in life through the church and through uh, these teaching of these others so uh, we, we see here 
the, the church as we know it today is not just this building of, of the wood and, and windows, but the church is the people, and the people, all of God's people, uh, we should care for each other. And, and as our work, we try to set examples or try to reach others who are lost, try to give them the word and try to show them the plan of salvation that they too may accept Christ who died for them and that they may as a child of God have the right to inherit eternal life. So uh, we, we see in uh, Revelation as John was there on the Isle of Patmos uh, writing he said in revelations 22 and 17 the spirit and the bride say come let him that heareth say come let him that is a thirst come whosoever will not excluding anyone not excluding gentile not excluding any any nationality but whosoever will that'll hear and believe be willing to repent or change make that confession and accept Christ as their Savior and be baptized for the remission of their sins this is is the plan of salvation that is laid out in the New Testament whosoever will those all of those care for each and every one of us care for each and every one out there who's lost that we try to reach. So even in in David's despair, you know, he says, nobody cares for me. But we know that all of these care for each and every one of us. And just as uh, David conquered this uh, giant Philistine, you know, we can conquer Satan's temptations. We can overcome. We know we're not tempted above that that we're able to bear we can hold fast in our faith and in our trust in the Lord and stay on that straight and narrow path and strive daily to do God's will we know at times we're weak we know we're not perfect but we know Christ has offered a second part and if we know we've said or we've done things we know we shouldn't that we should recognize that and come back and at, at that time confess those faults and have the prayers of the church so through God's love through Christ's love on the cross of Calvary they've all done so much for us these uh, New Testament writers these uh, people that established these New Testament church, they all love us. The church loves us and wants to win lost souls to Christ. So tonight, in, in closing, if uh, anyone is here who has not accepted Christ, we have opportunity to do that. The water's ready. If you know you've strayed for one reason or another, uh, Christ... Uh, has through inspired me and left his word for us to come confess those faults one for another and pray one for another that we may be restored there be one of either case won't you come tonight as we stand and as we stand sing this invitation